Green Rising. My friends, welcome back. For those who are now riding with me on this journey, and for those if it's your first time, what's up? How you doing? Welcome. Let's get with it. Today we are at the beginning of the week. We're going to jump off the week with some exciting stories and thoughts and opportunities for us to think about how we can advance ourselves and make money for ourselves in the future. Because that's what we do. Know everybody had a great weekend and we hear about positivity and positivity is thinking of someone in your life that you find admirable, that you love, respect, that you want to say something nice about and you look down in the comment section and go ahead, type you something real quick about that person, then forward this video to them and say, hey, Go check it out. Go look and see what I wrote about you. See if you can find it amongst all the comments. <laughs> With that said, let's have some fun today. Exclusive Pentagon poise to unveil, demonstrate, classify space weapon. It don't even. It, it, you can't use these words as classify space weapon and then show us some garbage. <laughs> Uh, we will see what happens. But for months, top officials at the Defense Department have been working towards declassifying the existence of a secret space weapon program and provide a real world demonstration of his capabilities. Breaking defense has learned. They were saying they were going to get close. Close enough to completion, there was a belief that the anti-satellite technology may have, may have been revealed at this year's National Space Symposium, which kicks off next week. See when this is. Yep, yep, coming up, coming up, coming up. But what's happening in Afghanistan is kind of taking maybe the attention of our national defense apparatus, as you can imagine. Uh, da, 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 da. But yeah, so the system in question long has been cloaked in the blackest of black secrecy veils developed as a so-called special access program. And we will definitely be talking about the differences between um, programs we know about and special access programs, SAPs, which sounds exactly what it sounds like. You have to have access to even know about the existence of these programs. Or and then there's even the theorized, or some people theorize, some people say it is, unacknowledged special access programs, which are special access programs that are not even acknowledged by the defense or the government in general. Um, known only to a very few very senior U.S. government leaders, while exactly which capability could be unveiled is unclear. Insiders say that the reveal is likely to include a real world demonstration of an active defense capability to, to degrade or destroy a target satellite and or, and or spacecraft. <laughs> and, and so this is what they talk about openly in the media. So what do they not talk about is, is or what slips out? How do you pierce, pierce together? Because I'm sure for some people here, it, it all sounds like science fiction, that this stuff is like, wait, these are articles that they're talking about how they have the we have secret programs that can uh, degrade or destroy satellites and spacecrafts. Yes. Expert speculation on what could be used for the demonstration ranges from a terrestrially based mobile laser used for blinding adversary reconnaissance sets to onboard proximity trigger radio frequency jammers on certain military satellites to a high powered microwave system that can zap electronics carried on maneuverable bodyguard satellites. However, experts and former officials interviewed by breaking defense has probably does not involve a ground based kinetic interceptor. So basically we're not going to shoot a missile up to hit things. We've already demonstrated that uh, capacity. China has demonstrated that capacity. So, you know, we can get into the, to the, to the land of, well, let me see if we go before we go into the land of high speculation here on this channel. Because uh, we showed that in 2008 with the burnt frost uh, satellite shoot down. 
Now, the, the article goes on and talks about the difference between, and I'm not going to read too much into this, but the difference between keeping that, you know, you know, not not always showing your hand, not always letting everybody know your capacity versus having that deterrent to where people don't have to act in a way where you have to show exactly your your capabilities. And that's a, you know, that's a balance of the scales that we have to weigh. Do we let everybody know, kind of have a sense of what all we can do in terms of a military? Or do we uh, just sit there and, 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 and you know, watch people um, strut around and think they're ready and tough and not act to our fullest capability at times? You know, it's, it's a balancing act, I would imagine. So do we, are we, how transparent, do we be transparent or and show our ace in the hole abilities? That's what they call it. We need to look very, very hard at the capabilities we keep concealed as in our quote, ace in the hole capabilities, if you will, that we would only use in an actual conflict to ensure we maintain the military overmatch that we would need to ensure victory without allowing an enemy to devise ways to defeat that particular capability by having advanced knowledge of it. So, and that's the argument. If you give them an enemy forewarned is an enemy forearmed. So an enemy who has knowledge of what your capability is, is going to try to devise means to counter, to, to have to counter that uh, capability that you have. So if you do, if you come up with a sword, somebody go develop a shield. <laughs> you know, you develop uh, projectile weapons like guns. Somebody's gonna develop body armor. That's is it's the nature of the beast. But also the deterrence of knowing that we have the ability to do something that no one else can do, and would you know? And that's why I always think when people are like, oh, with China and Russia, I was like, yeah, but you know, for those D twenty one, which is um, China's supposedly carrier killer missiles, that they have a whole force of of missile force. Of, you know how we have the. Uh, I believe it's. I don't want to misspeak on this, but I want to say I think I think I think yeah. They, I think like how we have an army, navy, air force, space force. They have you know their army, navy, air force, missile force. <laughs> you know it's, it is a force of uh, their armed services because you know they understand that our carriers give us such an advantage. In, in conventional battle or unconventional battle, but in conventional battle, definitely that they've developed an entire force to be a deterrence for that. And I'm like, well, OK, nice. Very, you know, but how do you think those missiles are going to hit us if we destroy your satellites and your ability to see where our carriers are at? And don't think we not thinking exactly that. I mean, you know, I ain't trying to put our business out there, but let's be real. That's what we about here, about that realness. So, okay, me going down crazy speculation lane now. This is just things I've read over the years. You can go look some of this stuff, try to Google it, and, you know, how much of it is crazy talk versus what may be some of the things that I said are not talk, spoken about. I'll, I'll, I'll just do a little bit of that, all right? Scalar technology. Scalar. S-C-A-L-A-R, Scalar. I think I may be pronouncing that correctly, which basically is using technology that Tesla developed, Nikolai Tesla, back over 100 years ago, death rate type technology where you're using inference with sending rays from different points, like people would talk about harp technology and uh, able to connect it at different points. This may have be something similar to what being done to some of our officials with the Havana syndrome. And we'll talk about that when something else comes out about it in the news, unless I just bring it up as a, you know, random thing to, to bring up in something else. So anyway, you send a wave 
energy wave from one place, another energy wave, and when they meet at, they cause weird things to happen. You know, can you cause natural phenomena like earthquakes or uh, wildfires to spring out of nowhere? <laughs> See, this is where like, yeah, the space laser, the lasers from space. Hey. It's a lot of a lot of theories out there. What could be happening? Particle beam weaponry. Now, these are things that we have been working on since the 1980s with the Star Wars program, United States, or the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, where we are, you know, we discussed here about directed energy weapons. So why not have vehicles in space or satellites in space that can incorporate directed energy weapons, especially against enemy satellites? Um, there are particle beams where we heat up ions to almost a plasma and, and shoot them. So it was almost like a project, a uh, more super advanced projectile different. Like so the difference between like a, a straight just projectile flying at somebody versus a just directed energy flying them is like the in between where it's a bit of both, you know, <laughs> energized uh, particles. Who knows? We don't know, but hopefully it'll be declassified. They said that uh, Trump was 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 thinking about it. Trump administration was thinking about this uh, declassifying, declassifying, declassifying it. But they didn't. I'm sh super shocked. But that may maybe that was one of those super weapons he was talking about that we had. But let us move on to more happier news. Investors are tripping on psychedelic startups despite a murky path to commercial success. So it's talking about a lot of VC money. Psychedelics are getting a, a new look at their therapeutic benefits. And because of that, the same way cannabis is now a multi-billion dollar industry, it is theorized that the psychedelics will eventually become, especially if, when, slash, if, when, we... And, and I mean, no, no, that's not even because, no, it, it, is, it is a win, not even an if now, because there has been um, a lot of evidence that demonstrated significant improvement with the use of these agents. So blah, blah, blah. Long story saying that there are now 18 venture capital firms, most of them founded in the last three years that have poured more than 79 million into the psychedelics field so far, according to a recent analysis by Business Insider. Their investment picks span not just psychedelic developers, but also companies that will support them, including ingredient manufacturers and chain of clinics where the drugs may have to be administered under strict supervision. Talked about Compass Pathways, which is developing a magic mushroom compound psilocybin to treat depression, raised $146 million in September, initial public offering, $144 million. And this is around the globe. It's not just America. This is around the globe. And $144 million in the secondary offering seven months later. And in June, Atai Life Sciences, I may be butchering that, Atai, backed by PayPal co-founder and Palantir, owner we discussed what palantir did was that yesterday day before about palantir with their big data role and collecting all that information and how they're putting gold and bitcoin onto their ledger as a backup for black swan events that potentially happen a black swan event is something like with the uh covid19 pandemic which was predictable but you couldn't predict how big it would get and so it was something that basically was unpredictable or not to the extent of the damage for a company an organization a family an individual and how you respond to that but peter till palantir's peter till in advancing the broad pipeline of psychedelics raked in 258 million from its ipo so a lot of money is going into the psychedelic market. Johnson & Johnson has made the murkiness of that commercial path all too clear. People are not sure, you know, because a lot of these drugs are still Schedule 1, unfortunately. 
after winning FDA approval in 2019 for its bravado, an antidepressant derived from ketamine, Johnson & Johnson's product was rebuffed by cost watchdogs and some insurers for its list price of $6,785 for the first month and $3,450 per month thereafter. It didn't help that the FDA required the drug to be administered under strict supervision at healthcare facilities. And so Spravato didn't run in 100 million in sales in 2020, estimated to peak, and is estimated to peak at about less than half a billion, or 450 million, they thought. And they think it's because of its um, in clinic administration profile, which will talk about this in a second is that it's bravado yeah you have to administer in a clinic um, under supervision but as a physician you can write for intranasal ketamine just regular basically generic ketamine intranasally at a certain uh, mixture to be used at home <laughs> <laughs> so and, and and that's da 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 America's regulatory framework in a nutshell. So it's Bravado, yeah. The name brand which costs a bunch of money, like they said, like six G's for the first month, three G's after that. Um and you gotta go to a clinic and pay a facility fee and pay for someone to sit there and watch you for like I think it's like an hour. Administration takes like about an hour, and they go watch it for an hour afterwards, about two hours. Or your physician can write for generic ketamine intranasally, get it compounded at a pharmacy, pay like 40 bucks. Probably not. I think it doubled up to like 80 or something. Who knows at this point? But, you know, way less than 6,000. It was like 40, 40 to 80. And that's a month supply. And, you know, that you can take your, the intranasal ketamine at home in the comfort of your home. But you don't hear about that because the Johnson Johnson pays so much money to do all this that they don't want you to even know that that's possible the other way. <laughs> They're talking about... Uh, Palo Santo, a Chicago-based psychedelics VC firm that launched in July with $35 million under management, is back in drug developers working on diseases ranging from chronic pain to obsessive compulsive disorder. One of its big bets is Beckley SciTech, a UK company with a portfolio that includes 5-MAO DMT, a drug derived from the venom of the Sonoran Desert Toad. The substance has been shown to have long term antidepressive effects similar to those of psilocybin and MDMA, but with an initial psychedelic trip that lasts for an hour rather than a day or more. And speaking of which, we talked about here Beckley SciTech just got um, investors just pumped $100 million into this firm. And they're looking at low dose psilocybin as well as intranasal 5 MEO DMT. Uh, they were initially aiming to collect just about 62 million. Okay, well, no, pounds. I should have doubled that. So we, okay, 62 million pounds, 62 million pounds, 36 million pounds, 62 million dollars. I'm sorry. And they're starting, um, it will use the money to finish this ongoing phase one, phase one B trial with low dose sub hallucinogenic psilocybin in patients suffering from rare and debilitating headache condition. Okay. Initiate a phase one dose range and study on intranasal 5-MAO DMT. And start a phase two trial in a treatment resistant depression and support the expansion of the company with new and unique. So this may be a company to keep an eye on in the future, Beckley SciTech. There's no shortage of universities deriving into psychedelic research, and that net has been cast wide with research involving compounds such as mescaline, ecstasy, ketamine, ayahuasca, and psilocybin. So this is going to be an exciting place to keep an eye on. We, you know, we are definitely here about innovation and ways to get ahead of the curve of where technology thought understanding is going to be so that we can 
A, benefit from it personally and for the ones that we love and the ones that are around us and the ones that we can influence with our um, with our understanding and knowledge and also financially because we're not stupid for a tenth of a second. <laughs> and how much money do you need to be happy? I tell you, they say about 60 some thousand. Now, I know that because we know that 36 thousand pounds is equal to 62 million. So 33 thousand pounds was equal to around 60 something, right? Late high 50s, early 60s. So we go straight to it. Boom. That's the answer right there. <laughs> and if you can't see the screen, I'm reading it. Pounds 300, 33,864 or more. So that's the minimum. Making that a year, how much would need to live in a happy life. So making that probably in a year, that's probably per year or having that average per year money coming in or access to. And that's in pounds, 33,864. So convert that to U.S. dollars. That's probably around 60, 60 G's or more. Or more. And more is the key part. The more money you are, the happier you are. Cause, and, and they talk about this here, but. It's about when they use the term relative deprivation in a sense where people do compare themselves to the family next door or their friends and stuff, which can be difficult depending on your, your group of friends. And you got to be careful with that. You know, um, happiness, you got to find contentment in the things that you need for yourself. Now, of course, you want to you want to have drive and ambition for more. You know, I think I told you the other day that I, that I wanted, you know, at least in the game with about 2.6 trillion. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a bit of ambition, but I'm content where I'm at today as well. So it's all bueno. Now, but having more access to more capital, having access to more money, why is it important for us to have be not be like I said earlier, just a little bit ago of of besides being better people? Why is it important to have money? Because money give you the ability then to invest in yourself in terms of time, in terms of opportunities, experiences, and not shallow experiences of, of just going to a place and, and having memories of being somewhere. I'm talking about real experiences of being able to, those things that you thought like, oh, wow, I would like to learn pottery. I would like to learn archery. I would like to learn computer program, whatever it is that you thought you didn't have time before, once you start to give yourself a little bit of breathing room and not feel that pressure. And a lot of people I see on my daily basis, one of the biggest problems, one of the, beyond childhood trauma, beyond, you know, a lot of these things is what, what leads to these problems, these, these decisions that were, and most of it's childhood trauma, <laughs> but that aside, it becomes then financial burden. And how do I fix this? Seems like it just, just acts hanging over me at all times. So, you know, like I said, money ain't gonna make you happy, but the lack of it don't help it either. So let's be real. We have to think about what ways we can um then they try to this article try to make you feel better but yeah but but if you if you don't have as much you're probably nicer though people who have more money become mean as they get money not necessarily that's you know that is a, a, a who you are and how you got there and the decisions you make but things change is that you know as you better yourself and find ways some of the same interpersonal relationships that you had changed because they will drag you back into that to where they're at if you allow it and so then yeah of course you change but it's a different story and when we're talking about different stories it's time for crypto <laughs> no nah, i'm joking but but there's no way to segue this is move on into another um finish up this show because i'm i've been going along and family getting hungry and I'm here doing this. 100 million funding round for Binance. They just ate, but they we're going to get hungry a little bit. I don't worry about them. They're fine. 
very, very happy and well-kept individuals. 100 million funding round for Binance U.S. falls through on regulatory concerns. Despite a failed $100 million funding round leading to the resignation of Binance U.S. CEO Brian Brooks, the exchange still has a sight set on launching an IPO. Way, way to be positive. You got you to gotta love that. The, <laughs> the uh, uh, Pen, Sh- Xinping Zhao, I'm maybe butchering that. Binance CEO, you, you gotta, you, that guy, has, he has moxie. He has a lot of moxie, as they say, <laughs> in the streets about 100 years ago. But no, he, uh, he, 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 he got, he got, he got, he got them, he got bars of steel. <laughs> the uh, CEO of, of Maine Binance, because he does not care. We're, uh, he's on a picture of him on the next page, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But let's talk. We, you know, we were looking at. And we remember we talked previously about how the the CEO had been in office for four months at Binance had resigned. We didn't know why. Now we know why because this is failed funding round. Regulatory concerns surrounding the Binance U.S. have reportedly culminated in investors backing out of a hundred million dollar funding round. The failed funding round also prompted Binance U.S. CEO Brian Brooks' surprise decision to step down after serving as as its executive for just three months. I thought it was four. I died. It's three months. So that's why he stepped down. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. However, the investors reportedly backed out. I don't know if, look, I was just joking with that sound. Don't try to copyright strike me for just a sound. However, the investor reportedly backed out. If I hadn't said it already, none of this is ever investment advice, medical advice, legal advice, advice on matters of the paranormal or matters of the heart or matters of anything that matter, that matter, matter. Matter, matter, matter. Don't ever come after me for anything. (laughs) Whatever. All right. So investors reportedly backed out due to concerns surrounding Binance CEO Xiaoping Zhao's 90% ownership stake in Binance's U.S.-based exchange. Hey, like I said, my man got, he got moxie. Alongside anxieties regarding an ongoing investigation from U.S. authorities that is reportedly scrutinizing Binance over money laundering and tax issues. So that's what was up. But they said skip it. They still trying to come out with an IPO at some point. (laughs) Zhao still appears confident that Binance U.S. will be able to attract investment needs and have an IPO. Okay. I hear that. And on that note, Binance taps Joshua Skoge, Skoge to be interim CEO. Skoge takes over from Brian Brooks, who resigned unexpectedly after just four months. Okay, so now, you know, this is how having, even having multiple sources show you that it's hard to know what the truth is. I'm guessing this is probably somewhere in between. That's why I usually say the truth is usually somewhere in between. You get both sides of the story, and the truth is usually somewhere in between so it's probably three and a half ish months joshua scores has become binance's u.s interim ceo replacing brian brooks who resigned unexpectedly earlier this month from the u.s arm of the crypto exchange binance strode joined binance us in january 2020 serving as the cfo chief financial officer brooks exit after just four months in the similarly similarly unexpected departure of the director of binance brazil have, I didn't even know about Binance Brazil that their uh, director left as well. Got to stay more on top. I see. I see. Have been among, passive voice, a series of challenges for the world's largest crypto exchange by trade and volume. Binance has faced intensifying regulatory scrutiny in several countries, including the UK and Japan. According to a report in the New York Times on Thursday, Brooks resigned after a venture capital investment he was trying to complete to diversify the company's ownership fell through. The potential investors were concerned that U.S. authorities were investigating Binance over money laundering and tax issues. And also, did they pay their... Did they pay the uh, 
fine to the to the CFTC or the SEC? Did they pay the protection money? Yet I, I can't remember. I know Bitmex paid like last week. Did Binance pay yet? Or we still wait for Binance? And then also uh, Ripple has to pay. And when Ripple paid, then they'll let XRP roll. But you gotta you gotta pay your, you gotta pay your protection money. They're here to protect us. How can they protect us without the necessary budget? Come on, come on, boys. And when that's gonna come up, we're gonna talk about that. That that bill they put through in the crypto infrastructure well, the infrastructure act with crypto, they trying to they trying to they say they're trying to get 28 million out of it. They 28 bill million. <laughs> They trying to get 28 bill off that. Like, hey, we about to tax these fools, son. According to the Times, Scrooge said in a statement that the company still intended to grow, including raising outside capital and expanding its board of directors with experienced leaders, among other blah, 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 blah corporate talk. So the reason why Buddy left, they uh, couldn't get that money up. He couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't pull off the the necessary tasks apparently apparently and they got a new dude in there who was a cfo been there for a while know what's been going on you ready to move into it the main head guy of binance global he, he's still like look we'll get it we'll get it worked out i'm gonna cut that check you know what the game is i'm gonna cut that check cut the check get it get it Everybody go shake hands, take pictures together, and we go run our business. So, you know. Why DeFi could be an $800 billion industry next year, according to a crypto expert. So decentralized finance, which we have talked about before, which is basically these algorithms on smart contract enabled protocols such as Ethereum, Cardano, Binance Coin, Tron, eventually Bitcoin will have that capacity as well. A lot of the other these coins include Uniswap, uh, Polkadot, Pancake. Let's look at it. over here. Look at Solana, Unicorn, Polygon, Compound, Ave. You know these are just some of the coins that dealing DeFi, you see they are doing well the market is doing well let's let's renew this make sure everything up to date okay it dropped a little bit but it was it was it was popping earlier overnight it was popping earlier overnight oh yeah cardano at 255 bitcoin around forty-eight thousand four hundred. ethereum three thousand one hundred seventy-seven. binance four Hundred and forty three dollars XRP a dollar twenty Doge thirty cents polka dot almost at twenty seven. Wow, Solana is going crazy. It's almost seventy five dollars. I remember it is was hovering at forties for the longest. Seventy five dollars. Uniswap about twenty eight. Chain link. 27 litecoin 180 okay litecoin getting your weight up terra is up almost 60 percent for the week polygon one one 160 i didn't even want to do that story about how, how they hired they you know polygon was the d5 protocol that was hacked for the, to the tune of 600 million last week but it you know U.S. dollars are relative. It was at the time six hundred million, um, but the guy who did it now they hired him as their head of of, of cybersecurity. <laughs> Which hey, like they should. His name was Mr. White Hat. He was showing them that it could be done, and so they they went and hired him. That's that's a that's one uh, way to do a job interview, job audition. Pancake swap twenty two. I have a, wow, 391. Cosmos been on a tear. Cosmos was at around like $10, $11 for longest. Now it's at 21. Algorand, $1.14 has been doing well. Shiba Inu, 
Tezos. BitTorrent usually kind of runs with, with Tron. I see if Tron is popping because usually BitTorrent and Tron run together. But Compound has been doing it. I guess it fell off a little bit this week. It did well last week, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, so this individual, Matthew Rozak, believes that decentralized finance can 10x from where we're at now in, in the next year. Right now, we're sitting at a DeFi market cap of about 80 billion. My sense is that a year from now, at a zero. And if we go back and look here, and this is like I said, a lot of stuff, just know what the market cap is. So right now, the market cap for, and you can't see it, how I have my screen set up, for Bitcoin is at $2 trillion. 55 billion right now so and you know do we imagine that the market cap you know i always think like well is the rest of the market cap go 10x from here do we imagine the market cap next year is going to be 20 trillion which then i mean bitcoin would be with everything with, with 10x so bitcoin would be at its you know parity with gold in terms of being close to 10 billion in and of itself Bitcoin market, dom I mean, Bitcoin dominance right now is at 44%. So it would be, you know, what, like eight, eight and a half trillion market cap in on 20 billion. Maybe close to nine. Rosex thinks that perfect storm is underway. Mainstream crypto adoption, a global chase for yield. And we talked about that yield farming where you borrow money and then loan that money you borrowed out for more interest than you're borrowing it. And so that way you always stay a little bit ahead of yourself. And inflated, elevated inflation all boosting DeFi's profile as billions pour into the industry. On current trends, a tenfold growth in DeFi by 2022 would be attainable. So far this year, assets committed to DeFi projects grew 385% according to DeFi Pulse. At that pace, total assets would break $800 billion near the end of next year. That's, that's something interesting. So if you're not into DeFi, maybe something to think about. Now, you may not want to get into the lending borrowing and lending and chasing that yield but the tokens and i believe it talked about that in here that more moreover much of DeFi's expansion has come from investors chasing massive yields what we talked about borrowing taking your your bitcoin wrapping in ethereum taking that wrapped bitcoin and then buying you know lending it out I'm going to hear you lend, here, I'm going to lend this to you and you going to pay me interest on it. And then taking, you know, some of your money and also borrowing um, other tokens. And it, 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 it's it's very complicated in that regard where there's a lot of borrowing and lending and, and chasing yields that you have to really put your mind into understanding um in that regard but the other thing what it says here is sometimes in a uh, chasing massive yield sometimes in the double digits available on platforms like compound and ave which often offer incentive tokens to inflate yield and attract users this sort of practice should be normalized so well, my point is going to be as opposed to being the one chasing the yield trying to lend out rap bitcoin or some people just get the tokens the tokens themselves appreciate so the ave the compound the uni swap the polygon the pancake swap you know people just solana people just buy the tokens themselves razak thinks the government's relationship with DeFi will be essential to the industry's continued growth in 2020 he joined the political action committee and they've been given a bunch of money about 50 50 dollars a crypto teach member of congress <laughs> And for those on Capitol Hill, he framed the issue with respect to crypto skeptical, crypto skeptical China as a possible area of strategic advantage for America. This country has an incredible 1990s internet level of advantage. Internet level advantage, says Razak. Seeing China crack down on crypto is like a trillion dollar gift that just been handed over. But the thought is that this is the future of finance and that those who make 
blockbuster decisions in a Netflix world will be left behind. And so we need to we need to not be left behind. We need to get ahead of it. With that said, I love you. You love yourself. God loves us. And that's all that matters.